Lewis screamed as the reptilian alien again jammed the electric probe into his side, his small body convulsing in agony. But the twelve-year-old boy still refused to divulge Earth's military secrets to his Ithorian torturers. Louis had been abducted from a space station while visiting with his parents, dragged onto an alien ship by the cruel, sadistic Ithorians. Led by the vicious Commander Karos, the Ithorians saw rapidly expanding humanity as a threat to their galactic dominance. Believing this human child could provide key intel to neutralize the human menace, they brutally interrogated little Louis, not realizing the depth of human resolve. Through the pain and suffering, Louis gained a grim understanding of the Athorian human conflict. He overheard his captors discuss their advanced technology and powerful ships that outclassed humanities. He learned of their merciless history and desire to subjugate other species, and he realized the Athorians were determined to break him at any cost. Commander Karos grew increasingly frustrated by Louis's refusal to betray Earth. He commanded his underlings to ramp up their torture to unimaginable levels. Electrocution, waterboarding, mind probes boring into Louis's skull. They pushed the very limits of what a human child could endure. Yet as he neared the threshold of his sanity, Louis recalled his father's tales of humanity's indomitable spirit, how humans always triumphed against impossible odds. With renewed determination, he vowed to never yield, even if it meant sacrificing his life. Louis would rather die than surrender. But unbeknownst to Louis, his parents had sprung into action the moment he was taken. His father, a high-ranking officer, rallied Earth's military to mount a rescue, while elite intelligence units worked feverishly to track the Athorian vessel. As despair nearly consumed Louis, Human ships suddenly dropped out of warp around the Athorian starship. Return the human child now, or be destroyed, came the ultimatum. The Athorian commander realized he had badly underestimated human resolve. Now the fate of Louis, the pride of humanity, and the galactic balance of power hinged on the coming confrontation. The Athorians would soon learn the true depths of human wrath, and the folly of trifling with their children. No matter the odds, humanity would never abandon one of their own, and the Athorians were about to pay dearly for their cruelty. Commander Karos's eyes narrowed as he stared at the viewscreen displaying the approaching human fleet. His scaly hands clenched into fists, rage boiling within him at the audacity of these inferior beings. He hit his fist on the console. Prepare for battle! We will crush these humans and show them the might of the Athorian Empire. The bridge crew scrambled to action, powering up weapons and shields. Karos turned to his first officer. Continue interrogating the human child. Break him before the fighting begins. We need that intelligence. Down in the interrogation chamber, Lewis's screams echoed off the walls as the mind probe dug deeper into his skull. Tears streamed down his face, but he gritted his teeth, refusing to yield. I'll never tell you anything, he spat defiantly. The Athorian interrogator increased the probe's intensity, sending fresh waves of agony through Lewis's small body. As the pain reached an excruciating crescendo, something snapped inside Louis. With a burst of adrenaline-fueled strength, he wrenched free of his restraints and lunged at his captor. Catching the Athorian off guard, Louis knocked him to the ground and bolted out of the chamber. Alarms blared as he raced down the corridors, desperately searching for a way off the ship. Ithorian soldiers gave chase, their heavy footsteps pounding behind him. Louis darted around a corner and spotted a small maintenance hatch. Prying it open, he crawled inside, his heart hammering in his chest. He navigated the tight passages, using his small size to evade detection. On the bridge, Commander Karos's face contorted in fury as he received word of the child's escape. Find him, he roared. Lock down the ship. He must not get away. Ithorian guards scoured the vessel, searching every room and corridor for the missing human child. Karos himself joined the hunt, his eyes blazing with persistence. As the space battle raged outside, Lewis's father, Admiral Mason, hailed the Ithorian ship. This is Admiral Mason of the Earth Alliance. Return my son immediately or face the consequences. Karos sneered at the human's image on the display. 
Your son is ours, human. And when we defeat you, your pitiful species will learn its place in the galaxy. With that, Karos cut the communication and returned his focus to the battle and the search for Louis. Explosions rocked the Athorian ship as the human fleet unleashed its weapons. The advanced human technology proved a formidable match for the Athorian's superior vessels. Amidst the chaos, Louis found himself in a dimly lit chamber filled with pulsing machinery. His eyes widened as he realized he had stumbled upon the ship's shield generator. A sudden realization hit him. If he could disable the shields, the human fleet would gain a critical advantage. With grim willpower, Lewis set to work, his small hands manipulating the alien controls. Sweat beaded on his forehead as he hacked into the system, his father's lessons on Athorian technology guiding his actions. Just as the shields began to falter, the chamber door burst open. Commander Caro strode in, flanked by a contingent of soldiers. Step away from the controls, child, Karos growled, leveling his weapon at Louis. Louis froze, his heart pounding. He met Karos's gaze, seeing the hatred and cruelty in the alien's eyes. In that moment, Louis understood the true depth of the conflict between their species. Please, Louis said, his voice trembling. It doesn't have to be like this. We can end this fighting. There's another way. Karos's finger tightened on the trigger his face twisted in a sneer. Louis closed his eyes, bracing for the inevitable. A crackle of static filled the chamber. Louis and Karos froze, their standoff interrupted by an unexpected voice over the ship's intercom. Commander Karos, this is Admiral Mason of the Earth Alliance. Louis's eyes widened. Dad? We've breached your communications. Human reinforcements are inbound. Surrender now and I guarantee fair treatment for you and your crew. Karos's grip on his weapon loosened. His reptilian eyes darted between Louis and the intercom, uncertainty etched on his scaly features. Louis seized the moment. Commander, please. This war, it's built on fear and misunderstanding. We don't have to keep fighting. The young boy's words hung in the air. Outside, explosions rocked the ship as the space battle reached its climax. Karos lowered his weapon. The humans, they fight with such ferocity. For a child. Because we value life, Louis said. All life. Even yours, Commander. A proximity alarm blared. The tactical display showed a wave of human ships dropping out of warp, surrounding the Athorian vessel. Karos slumped. It's over. He pressed a button on his wrist communicator. All Athorian forces, stand down. We surrender. Moments later, the ship's airlock hissed open. Human marines in powered armor stormed in, securing the bridge and engineering sections. Admiral Mason strode onto the bridge, his eyes scanning frantically until they locked onto Louis. Son! Louis ran to his father, burying his face in the man's chest as strong arms wrapped around him. I knew you'd come, Louis whispered. As human medics tended to the wounded, Louis found himself face to face with Karos once more. The Athorian commander sat on a crate, wrists bound. I underestimated your species, young one, Karos said. Perhaps there is much we could learn from each other. Louis nodded. I want to understand your people, too. Maybe then we can stop this conflict. News of the battle's outcome spread across subspace channels. On countless worlds, Beings of all species marveled at the tale of a human child's bravery. In the days that followed, Louis woke screaming from nightmares of his ordeal. But as the physical wounds healed, a new purpose took root. He devoured information on alien cultures, determined to bridge the gap between species. Karos, now held in a minimum security facility, found himself engaging in long conversations with human diplomats and xenobiologists. The more he learned, the more he questioned the Athorian Empire's militant stance. On distant worlds, human and Athorian leaders cautiously extended olive branches. The first joint scientific expedition was announced, a cultural exchange program proposed. Lewis watched these developments from his hospital bed. A spark of hope kindled in his heart. The path ahead would be long and fraught with challenges. But for the first time in generations, Humans and Athorians glimpsed the possibility of a shared future among the stars. 
The sleek diplomatic shuttle glided through space, its polished hull reflecting the distant starlight. Inside, Lewis Mason sat rigidly in his seat, his small hands holding onto the armrests. Despite the weeks of recovery, phantom pain still ghosted across his skin, echoes of the torture he endured. You okay, son? Admiral Mason asked, his weathered face etched with concern. Lewis nodded, forcing a smile. Just nervous, Dad. The shuttle docked with a soft thud. As the airlock hissed open, Louis took a deep breath and stepped onto the neutral space station. The cavernous docking bay bustled with activity, human and Athorian delegates mingling uneasily, their conversations a low murmur punctuated by the occasional reptilian hiss. Louis spotted a familiar figure across the room. Commander Karos stood tall among his people, his scales gleaming under the harsh lights. Their eyes met, and Louis felt a jolt of fear. But there was something different in Karos's gaze now, a weariness, perhaps even regret. The summit began with tense formalities. Humans and Athorians sat on opposite sides of a massive conference table, eyeing each other warily. Admiral Mason delivered a measured speech about the need for cooperation. The Athorian representative countered with veiled threats and grievances. Louis listened, his stomach churning. The diplomat's words seemed hollow, disconnected from the brutal reality he had experienced. When a recess was called, he tugged on his father's sleeve. Dad, can I talk to them? All of them? Admiral Mason hesitated, then nodded. I think that might be exactly what they need to hear. When the delegates reconvened, Louis stood before them. His voice quavered at first, but grew stronger as he spoke. I know you're all scared, he said. The Athorians are scared of humans taking over, and humans are scared of being wiped out. But I've seen both sides up close. Louis swallowed hard, pushing down the memories of pain. The Athorians who hurt me. They thought they were protecting their people, but there were others who showed kindness, even when they weren't supposed to. He turned to face the human delegates, and I saw how far humans will go to protect each other. We're not perfect either, but we can be better, all of us. A heavy silence fell over the room. Then, to everyone's shock, Commander Karos stood. The boy speaks truth, Karos said, his voice rough with emotion. I have seen the strength of humanity, yes, but also their capacity for mercy. He bowed his head. I can no longer be part of a military that would torture a child. I hereby resign my commission. Murmurs of surprise rippled through the Athorian delegation. One by one, other Athorians stood, echoing Karos's sentiments. The humans watched in astonishment as their longtime enemies expressed regret and a desire for change. The remainder of the summit took on a different tone. There were still heated arguments and old grievances aired, but there were also moments of genuine connection. Humans and Athorians shared meals, swapped stories, and even attempted to learn each other's languages. As the final day drew to a close, Louis found himself face to face with Kairos. The towering Athorian knelt down, meeting the boy's eyes. You have shown great courage, Louis Mason, Kairos said solemnly. Your spirit shames us all. Lewis managed a small smile. You're being brave too, you know. Changing your mind isn't easy. Karos nodded, a flicker of something like hope in his reptilian eyes. Perhaps there is a future for our peoples after all. As Lewis watched Karos walk away, he felt a weight lift from his shoulders. The road ahead would be arduous and taxing, but for the first time since his ordeal began, he truly believed peace was possible. Louis stood at the viewport of the interstellar transport, watching as the blue-green orb of the Athorian homeworld grew larger. His heart raced with a mix of excitement and apprehension. The diplomatic summit was behind him, but the real work of bridging the gap between humans and Athorians lay ahead. Admiral Mason placed a hand on his son's shoulder. You ready for this? Louis nodded, his eyes fixed on the alien world. I have to try, Dad. Someone has to take the first step. The transport touched down on a sprawling landing pad. As the airlock hissed open, Louis stepped out into the humid, Ithorian air. The gravity felt slightly heavier than Earth's, 
and he stumbled slightly before regaining his balance. A group of Ithorian officials waited nearby, their long necks swaying as they observed the human arrivals. Louis approached them, bowing his head in the traditional Ithorian greeting he'd studied. Greetings, honored ones, he said in carefully practiced Ithorian. I am Louis Mason, and I am honored to be a guest on your world. The lead Ithorian's eyes narrowed. You are the human child who speaks of peace, he said, his voice a low rumble. We shall see if your actions match your words. Lewis swallowed hard, but kept his composure. He followed the Ithorians to a large, domed structure that would serve as his new home and school. Inside, Lewis found himself surrounded by young Ithorians, their curious eyes fixed on him. Some looked interested, others wary, and a few openly hostile. An older Athorian instructor stepped forward. Class, this is Louis Mason, our guest from Earth. He will be joining our studies of galactic cultures. A ripple of whispers spread through the room. Louis heard snippets of Athorian speech. Human, war, dangerous. Louis took a deep breath and addressed the class. I know many of you have doubts about humans. I'm here to learn about your people and to show you that humans aren't your enemies. I hope we can learn from each other. The instructor nodded curtly. Take your seat, human. We shall see how you fare in our rigorous curriculum. As Louis sat down, he noticed one young Athorian watching him intently. The alien's eyes held not hostility, but genuine curiosity. Days turned into weeks. Louis threw himself into his studies, poring over Athorian history texts and practicing the complex tonal language for hours each day. Many of his classmates kept their distance, but Lewis pressed on, determined to prove himself. One afternoon, as Louis struggled with a particularly difficult passage of Ithorian poetry, the curious Ithorian from his first day approached. You mispronounced the third tone, the young alien said. It should be more like this. He demonstrated the correct pronunciation. Louis blinked in surprise, then smiled. Thanks, I'm Louis. I am Zorin, the Athorian replied. Your dedication to our language is impressive. From that small interaction, a tentative friendship began to form. Lewis and Zorin spent hours discussing the intricacies of their respective cultures. They explored the vast hanging gardens of the Athorian city, Zorin explaining the significance of each plant and creature they encountered. As Lewis's understanding of Athorian society deepened, he began to see the root of the conflict with humanity. In a quiet moment, he turned to Zorin. Your people fear being overshadowed, don't they? Louis asked. The strict hierarchy, the emphasis on tradition, it's all about preserving your way of life. Zorin's neck swayed thoughtfully. We have seen many species rise and fall. Humans are so young, yet so ambitious. It unsettles many. Louis nodded, pieces falling into place. But aggression isn't the answer. There's so much we could learn from each other. As his time on the Athorian world progressed, Louis found himself thinking of Commander Karos, the former enemy who had shown a willingness to change. Louis composed a message, reaching out to the Athorian officer. Karos's reply came swiftly. Your insights are valuable, young Louis. Perhaps together we can build the bridge our peoples need. Lewis and Kairos began planning a series of cultural exchange events. They organized workshops bringing together human and Athorian scholars, each sharing the unique perspectives of their species. At one such gathering, Louis stood before a mixed audience of humans and Athorians. His voice rang out clear and strong. I've seen the strength of both our peoples, he said. Humans' adaptability, Athorians' deep connection to tradition, Imagine what we could accomplish together, learning from each other instead of fearing our differences. As he spoke, Louis saw nods of agreement from both humans and Athorians. It was a small step, but an important one. The seeds of understanding were taking root. After the seminar, Zorin approached Louis, his eyes shining with excitement. Your words reached many today, Louis. Even some of the most skeptical elders were impressed. Louis smiled, feeling a spark of hope. It's a start, Zorn. We've got a long way to go, but I think we're on the right path. As night fell on the Athorian world, 
Louis stood on a balcony overlooking the city. The lights of human and Athorian dwellings twinkled side by side, a visual representation of the progress they'd made. Louis thought back to the scared, tortured child he'd been, and marveled at how far he'd come. A group of young Athorians passed below, laughing and chatting with a pair of human exchange students. Louis watched them go, a warmth spreading through his chest. It wasn't perfect, not yet, but it was a beginning. Louis Mason stood before the towering doors of the Athorian High Council Chamber, his heart pounding. The years of study, diplomacy, and personal growth had led him to this moment. As the first human ambassador to the Athorian High Council, he carried the weight of two species' hopes on his shoulders. The door swung open with a low groan. Lewis stepped into the circular chamber, his footsteps echoing on the polished stone floor. Ithorian council members perched on raised platforms, their long necks swaying as they observed him. Some leaned forward with interest, while others recoiled, their body language screaming distrust. Ambassador Mason, the lead counselor's voice boomed. You stand before us as a symbol of change. Not all welcome such change. Louis bowed deeply, careful to maintain the exact angle of respect he'd practiced countless times. Honored counselors, I come before you with humility and hope. Our peoples have taken the first steps towards understanding. I'm here to help us walk the rest of the path together. Murmurs rippled through the chamber. Louis caught snippets of Ithorian. Human ambition. Threat to tradition. Loss of identity. As the weeks passed, Louis threw himself into his role. He attended cultural ceremonies, pored over ancient texts, and engaged in marathon negotiation sessions. Yet for every small victory, a new challenge arose. One morning, as Louis prepared for another council meeting, his comm unit chimed. Zorin's familiar face appeared on the screen. Louis, we have a problem. Zorin's normally melodious voice was tight with worry. There's unrest in the southern provinces. Human settlers have been spotted near the Grove of Ancestors. Louis's stomach dropped. The Grove was one of the Athorian's most sacred sites. How bad is it? Bad enough. The local elders are calling for the settlers' immediate removal. Some are demanding all humans leave Athorian space. Louis rubbed his temples. We need to act fast. Can you arrange a meeting with the provincial leaders? We'll propose the joint council idea. Zorin nodded. I'll make it happen. But Louis, be careful. Not everyone will welcome this solution. The next day, Louis stood before a group of Ithorian elders, their scaled skin flushed with anger. He outlined the proposal for joint human Ithorian councils to oversee contested territories. This council would ensure fair resolution of land disputes, Louis explained. Both human and Ithorian cultural heritage would be protected. An elder smacked his head on the table. And who will protect us from human greed, from the destruction of our sacred lands? That's precisely what these councils will prevent, Lewis countered. By working together, we can find solutions that benefit both our peoples. As Lewis left the meeting, a commotion outside caught his attention. A crowd had gathered, waving signs and chanting in Ithorian. At their head stood a tall, battle-scarred Ithorian, Commander Varus. Humans out. Protect Ithorian sovereignty. Varus's voice cut through the din. His eyes locked onto Louis, filled with cold fury. Louis stepped forward, hands raised in a gesture of peace. Commander Varus, I understand your concerns. Please, let's discuss this. There's nothing to discuss, human, Varus spat. Your kind has no place here. Leave now, or we'll make you leave. The crowd pressed closer, their angry voices rising. Louis stood his ground, even as fear clawed at his insides. Suddenly a familiar voice rang out. Enough! The crowd parted. Commander Caro strode forward, his presence commanding respect even from Varus's followers. This human has done more for peace than any of us, Caros declared. I've seen his courage firsthand. Are we so blinded by old hatreds that we'd throw away this chance? Varus snarled. You're a traitor to your own kind, Karos. No! 
Kairos replied calmly. I'm fighting for our future, a future where our children don't grow up fearing humans or anyone else. As the two Athorian commanders faced off, Louis's mind raced. The situation balanced on a knife's edge. One wrong move could undo years of progress. But if he could find the right words, the right approach... Louis took a deep breath and stepped forward, ready to make his stand. Louis's heart pounded as he faced Commander Karos in the dimly lit conference room of the neutral space station. The tension in the air was palpable, but a glimmer of hope shone in both their eyes. It's risky, Karos rumbled, his long neck swaying. Varus and his followers won't come quietly. Louis nodded, running a hand through his hair. I know, but we have to try. If we don't address their concerns head on, this powder keg will explode. They spent hours refining their plan, poring over cultural protocols and security measures. When the day of the summit arrived, Louis stood at the entrance of the Grand Assembly Hall, watching as delegates from both species filed in. Humans in crisp uniforms sat alongside Athorians in their flowing robes, an uneasy mix of curiosity and wariness on their faces. The air crackled with tension as Varus and his supporters entered, their eyes narrow and postures rigid. Louis stepped forward, extending his hand in the traditional Ithorian greeting. Welcome, Commander Varus. I appreciate your willingness to participate in this dialogue. Varus's gaze could have melted Dura Steel. Do not mistake my presence for approval, human. I am here to defend my people from your encroachment. As the summit began, Varus took the floor. His voice boomed through the chamber, each word dripping with barely contained fury. Humans swarm across our worlds like locusts, devouring our resources and corrupting our youth. Varus's neck swelled with emotion. We demand the immediate removal of all human settlers. And as for you, Mason, he spat the name like a curse. Your so-called ambassadorship is a farce. You have no place among our people. Louis listened, his face a mask of calm even as Varus's words stung. He observed the reactions of the crowd, some nodding in agreement, others shifting uncomfortably. When Varus finally concluded his tirade, Louis stood. The weight of two species' futures pressed down on his shoulders as he approached the podium. He took a deep breath, remembering all the lessons he'd learned, all the friendships he'd forged. Commander Varus, honored delegates, Lewis began, his voice steady. I hear your fears. The fear of losing what makes you unique, of seeing your traditions fade away. I understand because I've lived among you. I've celebrated your festivals, mourned your losses, and marveled at the beauty of your world. Lewis paused, making eye contact with various members of the audience. But I've also seen the strength that comes from our differences. The innovations born from the meeting of our minds the friendships forged across the stars. He gestured to the assembled crowd. Look around this room, humans and Athorians sitting side by side. We've come so far from the days of conflict and mistrust. Why throw that away now? A murmur rippled through the audience. Lewis saw uncertainty flicker across some of the hardliners' faces. He pressed on, recounting specific instances of cooperation between their peoples, the lives saved the discoveries made. Then, in a move that sent shockwaves through the assembly, Lewis called out, Commander Karos, would you join me? Karos rose from his seat, his massive form casting a shadow as he made his way to the stage. Louis saw confusion and anger on Varus's face. Many of you know the history between myself and Commander Karos, Louis said, his voice thick with emotion. He was my captor, my torturer, and now he stands beside me as an ally and friend. Caro stepped forward, his voice resonating through the chamber. I once saw humans as the enemy. I hurt this child, believing I was protecting my people. He turned to Lewis, regret etched on his alien features. But through his courage and forgiveness, I learned that our strength lies not in isolation, but in understanding. As Lewis and Karos recounted their shared journey from enemies to allies, a hush fell over the room. Even Varus seemed taken aback by the raw honesty of their words. Suddenly, a young female Ithorian stood up from among Varus's supporters. Her voice quavered but grew stronger with each word. 
Father, please listen. I've studied with humans, worked alongside them. They are not our enemies. Varus's head snapped around, his eyes wide with shock. Lara, what are you doing? Lara stepped into the aisle, her gaze steady. I'm speaking the truth, Father. The future you fear, it's already here. And it's beautiful. The assembly erupted into a cacophony of voices. Ithorians argued with each other in their musical language, while human delegates whispered urgently. Louis watched as Vera struggled to maintain control of his followers, many of whom were now engaging in heated debates with their neighbors. The fate of two species hung in the balance as the summit reached its climax. Louis locked eyes with Kairos, both knowing that the next few moments would shape the course of history. The success of the summit reverberated through both human and Ithorian societies. Louis stood before the Ithorian High Council once again, his heart racing with a mix of excitement and trepidation. Honored counselors, he began, his voice steady despite his nerves. We stand at a crossroads. The summit has shown us the potential for cooperation, but words alone are not enough. I propose we take a bold step forward, the establishment of a joint human Ithorian colony. The chamber erupted in a cacophony of voices. Some counselors leaned forward, interest gleaming in their eyes, while others recoiled, their necks swaying in agitation. Preposterous, one elder shouted. How can we trust humans with our sacred lands? Lewis raised his hands, waiting for the clamor to subside. I understand your concerns. This colony would be built on neutral ground, a place where both our peoples can come together as equals. Over the following weeks, Lewis worked tirelessly to gather support. He met with human officials, Ithorian elders, and everyone in between. Karos and Zoran stood by his side, their presence a testament to the bridges already built. In a dimly lit conference room, Louis faced a group of skeptical human business leaders. Think of the opportunities, he urged. New resources, new markets, new technologies born from the merging of our knowledge. One by one, influential figures from both species began to back the project. The tide was turning. Months passed in a blur of negotiations and planning. Louis found himself on the bridge of a survey ship, staring out at a pristine world of azure oceans and verdant continents. It's perfect, Zoran breathed, his long neck craning to take in the view. As construction began, Louis walked the muddy paths of the fledgling colony. Human and Ithorian workers toiled side by side, erecting structures that blended the architectural styles of both species. The living quarters need to be taller, an Ithorian engineer insisted, gesturing with his four-fingered hands. Our people require more vertical space. Lewis nodded, making a note on his data pad. We'll adjust the plans, and we'll need to ensure the atmospheric controls can handle the higher humidity Ithorians prefer. Every decision was a delicate balance, but slowly, the colony took shape. The day of the groundbreaking ceremony arrived, and Louis stood beside Karos on a makeshift stage. Before them, a sea of faces, human and Ithorian, watched with anticipation. Today, we lay the foundation not just for buildings, but for a shared future, Louis declared, his voice carrying across the crowd. I christen this colony Unity, a name that embodies our hopes and dreams. As Lewis and Karos pressed their hands to the activation panel, a cheer went up from the assembled dignitaries. The central hub's foundation hummed to life, its energy fields shimmering in the sunlight. Weeks later, Louis watched as the first wave of colonists disembarked from their transport ships. Humans lugged crates of supplies while Ithorians carried potted seedlings from their homeworld. Among them, he spotted a familiar face, Lara, Varus's daughter, hand in hand with her human husband. Welcome to Unity, Louis greeted them, unable to keep the smile from his face. You're part of something historic. Lara's eyes shone with excitement. We wouldn't miss this for anything. Unity is the future we've dreamed of. As the colony grew, so did the challenges. Louis found himself mediating disputes almost daily. In the community center, he sat between a human farmer and an Ithorian botanist, their voices raised in frustration. The irrigation system is flooding our traditional root vegetables, the human complained. The Ithorian's neck swayed in agitation. 
And your method is starving our sacred healing plants. Louis listened carefully, then proposed a solution. What if we create alternating sections? We can adjust the water flow for each area independently. Both parties considered this, then nodded grudgingly. It wasn't perfect, but it was a start. Months turned into years, and unity flourished. Louis stood in the colony's medical center, staring in awe at the newborn in the incubator. The child's skin had a faint greenish tint, and its neck was slightly longer than a human infant's. Yet its eyes, when they opened, were unmistakably human. The first human Athorian hybrid, the doctor said softly. Lara and her husband must be overjoyed. Louis placed his hand on the incubator, his vision blurring with tears. This child was everything he had worked for, a living symbol of unity between their peoples. News of the birth spread like wildfire. Soon, unity was flooded with scientists, journalists, and curious visitors from both species. Lewis watched as a team of xenobiologists carefully examined the hybrid child, their excitement palpable. The implications are staggering one human scientist exclaimed. This could revolutionize our understanding of interspecies genetics. An Ithorian cultural expert nodded in agreement. And the social ramifications. This child bridges our worlds in a way we never thought possible. As unity continued to grow and thrive, Lewis often found himself standing on the balcony of the central hub, looking out over the bustling colony. Humans and Ithorians walked the streets together, worked in the same offices, shared meals in the same cafes. It wasn't perfect. There were still disagreements and misunderstandings, but it was real, tangible progress. One evening, as the twin suns set over unity, Karos joined Lewis on the balcony. The Athorian's eyes held a warmth that would have been unthinkable years ago. You've done it, Louis, Karos said, his voice filled with pride. You've shown us all what's possible when we work together. Lewis shook his head, a smile playing on his lips. We've done it, old friend, all of us together, and this is just the beginning. The tranquil streets of unity erupted into chaos. Human colonists collapsed, their bodies racked with violent coughs and fevers. Outside the medical center, a line of the sick stretched for blocks. Inside, doctors and nurses rushed from patient to patient, their faces etched with exhaustion and fear. Louis stood in the command center, his eyes fixed on the holographic display of unity. Red dots representing infected individuals multiplied across the map at an alarming rate. It's spreading too fast, he muttered, running a hand through his graying hair. We need answers. He activated the comm link. Karos, Zorin, we need your help. Unity is under attack by an unknown pathogen. Our medical teams are overwhelmed. Karos's deep voice resonated through the speaker. I'm on my way, Lewis. I'll bring our best scientists and investigators. Within hours, Ithorian shuttles descended from the sky, carrying teams of experts. Lewis met them on the landing pad, his face haggard from sleepless nights. Thank you for coming, he said, clasping Karos's hand. We've lost dozens already and hundreds more are infected. The Ithorian scientists wasted no time. They set up mobile labs, analyzing blood samples and environmental data. Human and Athorian researchers worked side by side, their differences forgotten in the face of crisis. Days passed in a blur of tests and theories. Louis paced the lab, watching as another batch of results came in. Dr. Alara, the lead human virologist, gasped. This isn't natural, she said, her voice shaking. The virus is engineered to target human DNA specifically. Karos leaned in, his long neck curving to examine the data. And look at these molecular markers. They're consistent with Athorian biotech. Lewis felt a chill run down his spine. You're saying this is an Athorian weapon? Before Karos could respond, an alert blared from the security station. Intruder detected in water treatment facility. Security footage showed a cloaked figure tampering with the filtration systems. As guards rushed in, the intruder fled, dropping a vial of dark liquid. That's our smoking gun, Louis said grimly. We're dealing with deliberate sabotage. Further investigation revealed a trail of evidence leading back to a hidden facility deep in Athorian territory. The pieces fell into place, 
Verus, the failed uprising, and now this attack. Lewis gathered his team in the war room. Karos, Zoran, and Lara stood around the hollow table, their faces grim. We know where Varus is hiding, Louis said, pulling up a map of a fortified compound. And we know he has the cure. We have to go in and get it. Lara stepped forward, her eyes blazing with tenacity. I'll lead the strike team. I know my father's tactics better than anyone. As they finalized their plan, Louis couldn't shake a sense of dread. The fate of unity, of both their species, hung in the balance. The strike team's dropship cut through the night sky, its stealth systems engaged. Louis sat next to Lara, checking his gear one last time. Remember, he said softly, we need Vera's alive if possible. He might be the only one who knows how to mass-produce the cure. Lara nodded, her eyes sharp. I'll do what needs to be done. The dropship touched down silently in a clearing near the compound. Elite human and Athorian operatives moved out in perfect sync, years of joint training evident in every step. They breached the outer defenses with surgical precision, but as they pushed deeper into the facility, resistance stiffened. Plasma bolts sizzled through the air as Varus's fanatics fought back with frenzied intensity. Lewis ducked behind a console as return fire peppered his position. He keyed his calm. Lara, we're pinned down in the east wing. What's your status? Almost to the main lab, she replied, her voice strained. Heavy opposition, but we're pushing through. Suddenly, a familiar voice boomed over the facility's speakers. So, the great unifier comes to destroy us. Varus's words dripped with contempt. You and your human pets have corrupted our people for the last time, Mason. Louis stood, facing the nearest camera. It's over, Varus. We know what you've done. Surrender now, and we can end this without further bloodshed. Varus's laugh echoed through the halls. End it? Oh no, Louis. This is just the beginning of our purification. The battle raged on, room by room, corridor by corridor. Louis fought his way toward the central chamber, where he knew Varus would be waiting. As he rounded the final corner, he saw him, the Athorian who had once been his fiercest opponent, now twisted by hate into something barely recognizable. Varus, Louis said, lowering his weapon. It doesn't have to end this way. Think of your daughter, of the future we've built. Varus's eyes blazed with fanatical fury. The future? You've destroyed our future, human. You've polluted our bloodlines, weakened our species. No more. He lunged forward, a vibroblade glinting in his hand. Lewis dodged, feeling the blade slice through the air inches from his face. Listen to me, Lewis pleaded, backing away. The colony is thriving. Your grandchild, a symbol of what we can achieve together, is growing up in a world of peace and understanding. Is that really something you want to destroy? For a moment, doubt flickered in Varus's eyes. Then his face hardened once more. Pretty words, human, but they won't save you or your kind. The two circled each other, the fate of two species hanging on the outcome of their confrontation. In the distance, Lewis could hear the sounds of battle, his team fighting to secure the cure that could save countless lives. He took a deep breath, knowing that the next few moments would shape the future of human-Athorian relations forever. Louis stood amidst the rubble of what was once Unity's thriving central plaza. Twisted metal and shattered glass crunched beneath his boots as he surveyed the devastation. The acrid smell of smoke still hung in the air, mingling with the unmistakable scent of death. Karos approached, his elongated neck bowed under the weight of their shared burden. The last of the human survivors have received the cure, he said, his voice low and gravelly. But the cost... Lewis nodded, unable to find words. They walked together through the ruins, passing the skeletal remains of buildings that once symbolized hope and cooperation. Human and Ithorian bodies lay side by side, a grim testament to the shared suffering of both species. In what remained of the medical center, Lara sat motionless, cradling her hybrid child. Her eyes, once bright with optimism, now stared blankly at the wall. Louis knelt beside her, placing a gentle hand on her shoulder. Lara, he said softly, I'm so sorry. She turned to him, her voice barely a whisper. My father did this. 
My own father. Louis felt the weight of her words, the crushing irony that the very man who had opposed their union had now robbed Lara of her husband. The child in her arms stirred, a living reminder of what they had fought to achieve. Days later, under a leaden sky, Louis and Caro stood before a sea of simple markers. Human and Athorian mourners gathered, their differences forgotten in shared grief. As names were read aloud, sobs and keening cries rose from the crowd. Louis stepped forward, his voice carrying across the assemblage. We gather today to honor those who gave everything for our dream of unity. Their sacrifice, he paused, swallowing hard. Their sacrifice must not be in vain. As the ceremony concluded, a young Athorian aide rushed up, his breath coming in ragged gasps. Commanders, he panted. We've just received word. Varus, he's alive. He escaped. The news spread through the crowd like wildfire. Angry voices rose, humans and Athorians alike calling for vengeance. Lewis raised his hands, trying to calm the growing storm. Later, in the makeshift command center, Lewis and Karos faced their advisors. The human security chief smacked his palm on the table. We need to hunt Varus down now before he can regroup. An Athorian elder shook her head. More violence will only breed more hatred. We must seek a peaceful resolution. Lewis looked to Karos, seeing his own doubts reflected in his friend's eyes. They retreated to a private chamber, away from the clamor of competing voices. Did we push too hard too fast? Louis asked, slumping into a chair. Were we naive to think this could work? Karos's neck swayed as he considered the question. Perhaps, but naivety born of hope is no sin, Louis. They sat in silence, the weight of their decisions pressing down upon them. Finally, Louis stood. Come with me, he said. They made their way to the outskirts of the ruined colony where a solitary grave stood apart from the others. The marker bore the name of Lara's husband. Louis knelt, brushing debris from the simple stone. He believed in what we were doing, Louis said softly, enough to give his life for it. Karos nodded. The path ahead is dark, my friend, but we must continue for his sake, for all their sakes. As they stood, looking out over the ruins of unity, Lewis felt a familiar commitment building within him. The road ahead would be long and fraught with danger, but they had come too far to turn back now. We'll rebuild, he said, his voice growing stronger, and we'll find a way to truly unite our people, no matter how long it takes. Karos placed a four-fingered hand on Lewis's shoulder. Together, he agreed. They turned back toward the colony, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. The ruins of unity loomed behind them, a stark reminder of the price of failure and the importance of their continued struggle. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.